So diffuse pattern alopecia is a subset of androgenic alopecia, a more severe form of androgenic alopecia and is characterized by uniform thinning across the scalp but predominantly affecting the vertex and the mid scalp regions. While the precise data on diffuse pattern alopecia is limited, androgenic alopecia as a whole affects up to 50% of males and females as well with prevalence increasing with age. Though the prevalence increases with age, but the earlier the androgenic alopecia appears, the more severe it gets down the road and the more severe it is to treat in the long term. Because more, more often than not, alope androgenic alopecia uh, appearing early has a higher chance of having the component of diffuse unpatterned alopecia or diffuse pattern alopecia. In women, the incidence of female pattern hair loss, which we call as FPHL, includes diffuse thinning patterns as well. And this is notably higher in uh, ladies who are postmenopausal and affects up to 75% of women, which is a very large number, women above 65 years of age. The prime uh, treatment of this malady, of this uh, issue is finasteride, a DHT blocker, finasteride, a 5-alpha reductase type 2 inhibitor is commonly uh, employed in the treatment of androgenic alopecia and is the mainstay of treatment of diffuse unpatterned alopecia and diffuse pattern alopecia. Before these patients can be considered for a hair transplant, which is always not a possibility because in these cases, the donor area is also compromised as much as the uh, place where you're planning to, planning to put the grafts. And it is very uh, less likely that in about 30 to 40 percent cases that with treatment with finasteride DHT blocker, you might get the patient's hair back over the head or you might stabilize the progression of baldness or thirdly, you might improve the robustness of the scalp donor, make it resilient enough to withstand the process of relocation transplantation. So uh, finasteride is the mainstay of the treatment. It's a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor and is employed in the treatment of diffuse pattern alopecia, diffuse unpatterned alopecia very routinely. And clinical studies have demonstrated that finasteride can halt hair loss progression within uh, within one to three, one to four months and stabilizes it completely within four to six months after having started uh, finasteride with noticeable uh, regrowth uh, typically observed at six months but may also take nine months to one year at times. Long-term studies including a 10-year evaluation in Japanese men has shown sustained efficacy and safety of finasteride one milligram per day with significant improvements in hair growth and stabilization, stabilization of hair loss. So it is important to note that uh, while finasteride is FDA approved for male pattern baldness for androgenic alopecia, its use in women is off-label and generally reserved for postmenopausal women because of its potential teratogenic capability effect. In such cases, there are alternative uh, treatments like spironolactone, which is an anti-androgen, or topical minoxidil, which may be considered, though they may be not as useful, not as effective, uh, and not having as good a safety profile as finasteride. For finasteride is an FDA approved medication and uh, along with minoxidil and these form the mainstay of treatment of androgenic alopecia and especially in cases of diffuse pattern alopecia. Another thing I want to drive home about diffuse pattern alopecia is that if you're contemplating, if the patient is contemplating a hair transplant with a condition diffuse pattern alopecia, he has to be counseled properly and he has to be religiously committed to long-term use of finasteride because the moment he stops finasteride within 30 days, 45 days, the, uh, if the results are going to peter out, to thin out, even vanish because these grafts which have been uh, taken from the donor area and moved to the bald area are dependent on finasteride. If you stop finasteride, they will go back to their original condition and therefore there was no point in, in taking up these patients for a hair transplant. So this uh, information, uh, this counseling is very important to drive home the point to the patients that if you want to start a journey of surgical hair restoration in your condition of diffuse pattern alopecia, it is very important to give it a thought, to take some time, do your research and then 
once you're committed to taking finasteride in the long term, or you can also take a trial dose of finasteride for one month and see how your body behaves with the drug, and then make an informed uh, decision of committing yourself to finasteride in the long term. If you're 25 years of age, if you're 27 years of age, you are definitely going to need finasteride for the long term. And with the long term, I mean, uh, till about 45 years of age when your bodiness will stabilize. And after that, you can decrease the dosage, taper it off, do not go to cold turkey. So if a person is not fit for finasteride and he has diffuse pattern alopecia, he has diffuse unpatterned alopecia, what does that person do? Well, there are other treatments available, though not as effective, not as, uh, uh, not as uh, uh, long lasting uh, as finasteride is in the treatment of diffuse, at unpattern, diffuse pattern alopecia and diffuse unpattern alopecia. But the thing is, when you start these treatments as an alternative to finasteride, you have to keep it in your mind that uh, when you start these treatments, since your uh, donor area is not going to stabilize, your, is not going to become robust, your baldness is not going to stabilize, it's going to continue to uh, make, make matters worse for you. Uh, if you are not on finasteride, please take it out of your mind that you are a candidate for a hair transplant surgery, surgical hair restoration, or ever will be. So these uh, other treatments, which will, may, which will also create some semblance of improvement, but not prepare you for a hair transplant, can be uh, topical minoxidil, 2% or 5% minoxidil, but please do not use 10% minoxidil, it causes severe headaches. And I have had several patients feeling dizzy in the workplace and uh, it's a big problem. So 2% and 5% uh, uh, minoxidil. 5% minoxidil for women is off-label. It's not recommended by FDA for use in women, but 2% is. But a lot of women are using 5% minoxidil. If, it, if their body tolerates it well. So uh, topical minoxidil is an FDA approved treatment for both men and women. And minoxidil promotes hair growth by prolonging its anagen phase of the growth cycle. And clinical improvements are typically observed after six to 12 months of consistent usage. And then we come on to low level laser therapy. Though there is no scientific basis, but people have seen improvement in growth results. And when you have a condition like diffuse, a diffuse pattern alopecia, and you do not have uh, the uh, commitment to take definitive treatment with oral finasteride for the long term, well, then you only have these options left to try and see if they suit you. So low level laser therapy, uh, devices such as laser combs and laser helmets have been shown to stimulate hair growth in androgenic alopecia patients. Studies suggest that LLLT can be as effective as uh, minoxidil, but not as effective as finasteride particularly when used in combination therapies. So I uh, will not discuss that uh, further much because we are dealing with only diffuse pattern alopecia candidates who are not willing to take definitive treatment. So let's not go into the controversy of low level laser therapy used in combination therapies. So, and then we have platelet rich plasma therapy. I do not uh, prescribe this treatment for reasons that it's not very, very effective and androgenic alopecia because it's not a DHT blocker. But in diffuse pattern alopecia, when we are not taking definitive treatment, you can try platelet-rich plasma therapy. It will give you momentary regrowth. It will give you a momentary strengthening of your follicles. And it involves, uh, PRP involves injecting concentrated platelets from the patient's own blood into the scalp, and it stimulates hair growth by stimulating the uh, stem cells. And uh, systematic reviews have indicated that PRP can improve hair density and thickness in androgenic alopecia patients. But that is another talk for another day. As far as hair transplantation is concerned, for patients with a stable donor, a donor which has been rendered robust, thick enough, good caliber donor hair after the usage of uh, tablet finasteride, and there is adequate hair density, surgical options like FUT and FUE can provide permanent solutions. But as I told you, once your hair are dependent on finasteride, you will have to take it in the long term up to say about 45 years of age. Hair transplant in the ideal condition in diffuse pattern alopecia is particularly effective where uh, you want long term natural results. But these patients are not, every, per every person with diffuse pattern alopecia is not a candidate for a hair transplant surgery. And then there are certain uh, emerging uh, treatments, adjunctive therapies, 
such as microneedling such as use of topical anti estrogens uh, sorry anti androgens the new one topilutamide topilutamide and these the these are being explored for their potential benefits in androgenic alopecia management however more robust clinical trials are needed to establish their efficacy and safety profiles treatments come and go every 2 years there's a new new treatment touted and then within 2 years you see you never hear about it again that is the tragic condition of hair loss treatment research today the only treatments that we have today for the past over 3 4 decades now are the two fda approved medications finasteride oral and topical minoxidil so it is very unfortunate that not much research is going into uh, hair loss treatment and uh, we are still at the same uh, place where we were some decades back so then we come on to these questions number one question number one which is uh, for the last one month i've been getting questions from patients about diffuse pattern alopecia and you can see diffuse pattern alopecia is so very common and increasingly it is becoming more and more common because of our lifestyle because of our habits uh, diffuse pattern alopecia when i was when i started my practice about 20 years back was not as common as it is today and every year uh, more and more cases are getting un are, are are unfit for hair transplant because the thinning in the donor area is unremitting it is relentless diffuse pattern alopecia patients and diffuse unpattern alopecia patients are increasing day by day every passing year and it is becoming so very common an, ep an epidemic actually of uh, diffuse uh, thinning which does not have much treatment which we can offer as hair loss treat as hair loss doctors and the hair transplant surgeons so coming to the first question how can clinicians enhance the diagnostic accuracy to effectively differentiate between dpa and dupa ensuring appropriate treatment pathways well differentiating between dpa and dupa is pivotal only after you have differentiated it can you uh, make a plan for the treatment can you set in place protocols for management of these two conditions and this differentiation directly influences treatment decisions dpa that is diffuse pattern alopecia typically presents with diffuse thinning confined to the top of the scalp preserving the occipital donor area making patients suitable candidates for hair transplantation but after management with medication in contrast dupa diffuse un pattern alopecia involves uniform thinning across the entire scalp including the sides back and rendering the donor area unstable and unsuitable for transplantation diagnostic tools such as trichoscopy can reveal reveal follicular miniaturization patterns but it can also easily be done um, um, clinically scalp biopsies are occasionally required in ambiguous cases to assess the follicular health and to rule out scarring alopecia wherever there is a doubt and recognizing these two patterns dpa and dupa is crucial to ensure patients receive appropriate and effective treatments Uh, then we come on to the question number two. What are the long-term outcomes of finasteride therapy in diffuse pattern alopecia patients, and how do these outcomes compare to those in patients with other forms of androgenic alopecia, the regular forms of male pattern baldness? Well, finasteride is an five-alpha reductase inhibitor, and has demonstrated significant efficacy in treating androgenic alopecia, including DPA. And long-term studies have shown that finasteride. can halt hair loss progression and promote regrowth particularly in the vertex region the crown area notably the vertex uh, type 5 male pattern baldness uh, exhibits the most rapid and sustained response with 89.7% of patients showing improvement and these findings underscore the importance of early intervention a stitch in time saves nine and this maximizes therapeutic outcomes and coming to the third question In cases where traditional treatments like finasteride and minoxidil are ineffective, what emerging therapies show promise for managing DPA and DUPA? See, though these are the keystones of management of various forms of androgenic alopecia, other treatments can be tried, but I actually really doubt that they will be beneficial if the definitive treatment has failed. But these treatments, as I told you earlier, are low-level laser therapy. platelet rich plasma microneedling and topical antiandrogens and a recent thing which has been explored is topical melatonin topical melatonin 
has antioxidant properties and may counteract oxidative stress in hair follicles because of lifestyle changes and potentially promotes hair growth. So this can also be tried in patients who have diffuse pattern alopecia. But these therapies are merely adjuncts or alternative therapies, not as beneficial as the keystone of treatment with DHT blockers. And, but they can be used in cases where traditional treatments are contraindicated or are ineffective. And this brings us to the fourth question. Given the diffuse nature of hair loss in DPA and DUPA, what criteria should be used to determine the suitability of patients for hair transplant procedures? Well, um, hair transplantation, uh, your uh, suitability or candidacy for a hair transplantation hinges on the stability and density of your donor area. There are no two, doubts, two ways about it. There's no doubt. In diffuse pattern alopecia, the donor area is typically preserved but poor, so there is still hope for surgical hair restoration. Conversely, in DUPA, that is diffuse unpatterned alopecia, the donor area is adversely affected and has many times reached a point of no return. Also, there is overall thinning on the head and there is no clear bald area or perhaps there is for the only the hairline and the temple points. Hair transplant therefore is not meant for DUPA unless it is just the hairline that is to be corrected. But judicious planning is required since procedures can lead to poor graft survival and suboptimal outcomes. Therefore, assessing the donor area stability is of paramount importance. And this needs to be assessed through clinical examination, diagnostic tools, uh, taking hist good history taking to avoid putting the cart before the horse in planning surgical uh, hair restoration. And the last question for the day, and then we end the talk, is how can, how can practitioners balance the desire for aesthetic improvement with ethical considerations, particularly in recommending invasive procedures for conditions like DUPA, where donor area stability is compromised. Basically, uh, to put it simply, when the patient is adamant on getting a hair transplant done, what is the approach of the doctor? Well, ethical practice mandates that treatments are recommended based on clinical indications rather than the patient desire or the patient's forcefulness or the amount of money that the patient is giving you. In cases like DUPA, where the donor area is compromised, recommending hair transplantation would be a very unethical de decision on the part of the doctor due to the high risk of poor outcomes. Practitioners should therefore prioritize patient education, discuss the limitations, discuss the potential risks of procedures in DUPA, and explore alternative treatments rather than straight away go in for a hair transplant surgery. This approach ensures that not all that glitters is gold and patients are guided towards safe and effective management strategies holding the interest of the patient prime, not the revenue generation of the clinic. So that is the end of the talk. If you have any questions, any doubts in your mind, please let me know. Uh, I will not be taking any questions now, but if you have any questions, please put the questions in this video once it is uploaded on YouTube. Uh, for those who haven't subscribed but are watching, please do me a favor, subscribe to the channel. I'll be very grateful because your engagement keeps the channel going and the commitment going. So have a nice day and may God bless you.